Hello everyone, this is Alex Carling, um, Director of Professional Practice and Quality Assurance, talking to you from Castle Poe. I hope you're well this afternoon and we will begin our webinar on peer assessment, the process and uh, your next steps. Now, um, I would be very grateful just to check that I'm coming through loud and clear. I was wondering if someone in the question box that you have could just type and let me know that you can hear me and see me. Thank you very much. I'd be very grateful for that. Um, and also to say that um, this is going to be um, an informal webinar and so um, please write your questions as we go along. Um, this is your opportunity um, and I really um, hope you find this useful. So I'm going to just have a look at the question box to see if anyone Yes, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's begin. Why are you here? Why are you watching this webinar? Well, you're watching it for one of two reasons. One, you were randomly selected to participate in peer assessment. Um, and just to explain a little of a randomization process, we're selecting this year and going forward 65 members um, to be peer assessed. Now, uh, the staff have absolutely nothing to do with the random selection process. Um, it is the director of IT who uses a software program and there is a selection pool um, and you can rest assured once you've completed this process that you will be out of the pool for 10 years. So um, that is how the majority of you have joined us today. There is a second group of people um, who join us are between about five and eight every year. And those are registrants who do not meet our um, currency requirements. That is, they um, do not have 750 hours of direct or related service um, over a three-year period. So to reassure the public that um, they are still current, they are required to participate in the peer assessment process. So that is um, uh, everything really I have to say about selection. So let us move on to um, your next step. So. Um, the next step is really just submit, complete and submit your SAT. Just focus on that um, and make sure it's done by January the 31st. And then that's something, you know, one less thing to think about. Now, we've given you until Friday, March the 6th, um, uh, uh, to upload your evidence to your SAT to show that you are meeting the standards, okay? So that gives you a good, um, after submission, a good five weeks, but sort of from now on that, I think that gives you about seven weeks, okay? Um, uh, you do not have to resubmit, um, uh, you just upload your evidence. Okay, so let us talk now about evidence. So I'm just going here. Um, now this is a test site uh, of my of a self assessment tool, a clinical, and we are going to look at the evidence, uh, what sort of evidence, and how you submit it. OK, now um, we only require one piece of evidence for each of these indicators. 
Now, sometimes people have called and said, you know, I've got two pieces, they're different, it really shows what I do. That's fine if you want to do it, but we are not requiring it. You are only required to submit one piece of evidence per indicator. Now, what a lot of people have found useful, as I said, you don't have to, but uh, it could be um, an option, is they um, actually create a folder on their desktop um, of their computer um, or their laptop and just keep on putting in the evidence there and then when they are ready, uploading all together. But that is entirely up to you. OK, so let us think about the evidence. It's one piece. Now, it might be from um, a chart or a record, um, a student record, if you're working with in the schools, um, a patient record, if you are working um, in a hospital or rehab centre, or you might call it a client record. OK, now. Um, don't worry about the fact that you're uploading the information. It is an extremely secure website, um, the Skillshore website, and it is housed in Canada, and that's very important. You don't have to redact information, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to show this to you as well. Um, we're going to go now to the quality assurance section of the website and you do that, you just click on registrants, quality assurance program and then over here to the peer assessment program. The resources are in English and in French. So information for employers, let's have a look at that. This is something maybe you can give your employer if you want to, or someone from um, health records. If we scroll to the end, it talks about legislative authority for peer assessment. Now, in PHIPAA, you are allowed to disclose personal health information to the college without redacting and without consent for college purposes and quality assurance is a college purpose. Um, also, you are allowed to do this um, according to um, the RHPA code as well. OK, so you absolutely can upload clinical information. You do not have to redact it. OK, so let us now go back and um, let's, I'm going to go to patient-centered practice because another question we get is, can we upload one piece of evidence to two indicators if it's good inf evidence for both of those indicators? And the answer is yes. So here I have, I obtain and consent uh, and document consent for all intervention and 3.2 obtaining and documenting consent for the collection use and retention of personal health information now many of you might be working in places where you have a consent form and the consent covers both intervention and collection use and retention um, and disclosure of personal health information. So you might want to um, be uploading your consent form or your consent process, etc. Absolutely, it would be good for both indicators, but I would absolutely upload them to both of them. Okay, so upload to here and upload to here. All right. Um, now, I just want to remind you, don't go into a panic if you don't have a consent form. We don't require you to have a consent form. All you actually are required to do under the legislation is to obtain and document consent. OK, so if you have an example of your consent note in a patient chart, then um, uh, you just can upload it here. 
So let's now look at how we upload. I'll do it live, so to speak. So I clicked on this link and I am going to go to browse. And it actually takes me to my CV and job description um, folder. So I'm going to upload um, a CV. So there it is, just clicked on it and then upload files. And there it is. So it is quite simple. All right. Now, a few um, suggestions. Number one, check it. OK, because I do know of someone who uploaded everything and it was all upside down. <laughs> That's not very uh, helpful to the peer assessor. So let's go in. I'm going to double click on it and open. And here it is. OK, so I'm looking at it and I'm saying, oh, no, that's not the one I wanted. That's an old one. So I'm going to come out of it, go back into Skillshare and I am going to delete it. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is you might come across, you might be um, referred um, a, a patient, a child, a student, and it's going to be a much better example of evidence than something you already have. So you can do one of two things. You could just upload the second piece or you can get rid of the first one. So I'm going to do that in a second and then upload the better. Um, piece of evidence. Now you can do this, I would say, certainly up to about a month before your um, site visit. Okay, so I am just going to delete that. Are you sure you want to delete this file? Okay, and then I can upload my most recent one. All right, um, I'm just going to check and see what we're covering. I know what I'm going to say. So, talking about um, uploading something from a patient file, a student record, how recent should it be? Well, it can certainly be current, that, that's uh, um, absolutely excellent, but it could also be from a chart of a patient or student that you have discharged, but only go back three years. So you're thinking 2017, 18 and 19, okay? Uh, because then that is more recent information to show that you are meeting the standards. Now, I am going now to go here and scrolling down to I am knowledgeable about mandatory reports outlined in the RHPA and in the Child, Youth and Family Services Act. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about this and a different way of providing evidence. Now, the uh, mandatory report in the RHPA is when you um, it comes to your um, knowledge that another regulated health professional um, has is committing sexual abuse with a patient. You have to report that immediately to um, the college of uh, whichever college they are. If it's at schools, it would be the College of Teachers. If it was in a hospital, it could be the College of Nurses or Physicians and Surgeons, what have you. If they are not regulated, you have to report it to the police straight away. Okay, so also here, we've got the mandatory report for the Child, Youth and Family Services Act. Now that is when it comes to your attention that a child is being abused or neglected. Now, it doesn't have to be um, a, a child that you're seeing. You could be an audiologist, a grandmother comes in for a hearing assessment. They are very worried, break down in tears. You say what's wrong and they say that they think their grandson or their granddaughter's partner or something like that is hitting their child children too much or what have you. Um, you are required to report that. 
I'm out. I'm bringing it up because please do say that um, it, you meet the standard because you just have to know about it. Don't put down it's not applicable because it's applicable to all of us all of the time. But you might not have any evidence as such. So let's have a look at the examples of evidence. You just click here or they are in the SAT guide. So um, a copy of a redacted mandatory report, a mandatory report template, communication with others regarding mandatory reports. Um, some school boards, you might be lucky where they have a process in place and you can just upload a section of the policy. However, if you have no evidence, this is an example where you can write in the comments box and you can write words to the effect of, uh, I know my requirements with regard to mandatory reports. Um, I know um, I have to report in the case of sexual abuse um, or um, child abuse or neglect. However, I have not had any experience with it. So you would just write something like that in the comments section, okay? So I'm just going back to um, my cheat sheet. All right, I know what we're going to cover next. So I'm now going to go back to the peer assessment section on the website. Now we did send it to you, but don't worry, um, we can, uh, I want to show that it's here. Uh, we sent it to you in an email. How to submit evidence. Now, this goes through the process that I just did for my CV. It's pretty straightforward. There are some pictures there for you. But I'm actually going to scroll down to converting paper evidence into a computer file. Okay. Now, Although we're talking about paper evidence, there is a, another reason I'm going to be talking about this. You can scan documents um, or do a screenshot where you get a document um, uh, on your computer and do a screenshot. You can use a digital camera um, and take a picture of a piece of evidence. And actually what's quite good if you do do that, there are some very good PDF apps. So um, you can just convert it to a PDF document and then upload that. Or you can do the SNP tool, okay, and upload that. So um, you can, um, I'm using the SNP tool a great deal. I find it extremely helpful. So those are the ways you can uh, convert paper evidence into a computer file. You then just send it to you uh, yourself. You can um, uh, save it and, and uh, email it to yourself or what have you. Remember, as soon as it's on your computer or in your SAT, please delete it from your phone uh, straight away. Now, some people have asked, what if um, I want uh, just one piece of evidence from an extremely long policy and procedure? So you don't want the um, peer assessor to be scrolling through. So you can, by all means, just um, take a screenshot or use the SNP tool. Let's show you. I'm going to show you the SNP tool. So there it is. I'm going to add new. And then look, I can just snip that section and there you are. Can you see? And then I could, if I wanted to, um, save. All right. So there you are. So I'm going to actually get out of that now. So easy peasy. So you um, might only want to be um, saving one section of um, a piece of evidence. So I'm now just going to have a look. Um, yes. So if you have a form like we talked about the consent form or maybe another form that you use, an intake form that shows that you are finding out information about cultural considerations, etc. 
Um, that is excellent. Upload that as evidence. However, you should upload a completed form and not a blank form. A blank form doesn't show that you're using it in your practice. It's just a blank form. Okay, so I am now going to go to the questions. So I'm just opening up the question box and um, I've got a question here. Once the SAT is submitted, can we go back in to upload evidence? And the answer is absolutely. You will submit your SAT and then you can go back into it as many times as you want. And as I said, you do not have to resubmit when you're, um, you have all your evidence uploaded, okay? So absolutely, go in any time. The only time it will be closed to the entire membership actually is midnight on January the 31st to six o'clock February the 1st. And that is to show who has not completed and submitted their SAT. Otherwise, it's always open. In fact, 364 and a half days a year, it's open. Can we redact identifying information if we wanted to? Absolutely, you can, 100%, um, if you're more comfortable with that. Now, um, if your work has concerns about um, uh, uploading patient information, please let them contact me and I will explain to them the authority we have to allow you to do this. Um, this happens about once every two years. I talk to a health records department, so we're very used to it and we're here to help you. Okay, I uploaded some evidence in error. I already submitted my SAT. Uh, can I resubmit? Don't have to resubmit. The good news, the submission lets us know and, and thereby lets the ministry know and also lets the public know that um, you have completed the process, okay? Now you can go back in and, and change things and correct things and alter things as much as you want. We just know we have the evidence that you have completed the process and that's what we need, okay? So um, please don't uh, worry about that. Go back in, change the um, evidence um, and you do not have to resubmit, okay? And don't forget your evidence doesn't actually have to be there until um, March the 8th. Of course, you might want to get going on it, do it straight away, but it is March the 8th. Okay, so I think that's all the questions just now. So let's go on to the next part. Right, I'm going back into uh, Skillshare and we're going to look in professional accountability for a couple of reasons. Number one, you have to, again by March the 8th, upload your professional liability insurance. And we're asking you to upload it to 5.1. So you would just click here and upload. Now, sometimes it will be in the form of a letter from your employer. Sometimes it might be the actual certificate. I know I get my own personal um, professional liability insurance, so I could easily upload that. So whatever you use, um, and I will be sending you some information about um, uh, professional liability insurance uh, probably next week. Okay, so that's important for that section. And then we're going to go all the way down to here to what is written in red. Um, you are absolutely required to read the conflict of interest standard and confirm that you're in compliance. And this will be part of a discussion that you have with your peer assessor at the site visit. Okay, so this is the required document. I see we have another question, so I'm just going to go to it. And um, are we submitting uh, 
two types of evidence, uh, one for clacks and um, evidence uh, for the standards for 2020. Okay, right. Good question. Can I just say I'm going to come on to the clacks in a bit? Okay, so yes, you do have to submit evidence for um, each of the indicators, um, as you can see here, required for peer assessment. And don't forget, um, there is a guide. So let's go back into the peer assessment program. Here's the peer assessment guide, both in English and in French. Okay, so there'll be lots of good information there. So I'm going to talk about um, matching and then I please believe me, I am going to be talking about learning goals and clacks. So let us go here to the practice description. And if you scroll down here, you need to complete it. And then when you scroll down here, here is some more information that you are required to complete. Now, this is for the matching of yourself with a peer assessor. So I would add some information here um, uh, uh, about your role, about your practice. I know you'll be ticking off and, and the peer assessors will be looking at that, but just a little bit more information will certainly help them. Then you put in your number, your telephone number, email address, your site visit location address. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. And then which months you want your peer assessment to take place okay so that is the first step of the matching process we gather all of these there will be 65 and we divide them into groups first of all there will be a small amount of non-clinical registrants participating in peer assessment the audiologists will be hived off and then we divide the speech language pathologists into preschool, school age, private and adult services. And you will be pleased to hear that we have peer assessors um, in all of those areas of practice. OK, we have 25 peer assessors and we are training for more this year. OK, so at the peer assessment, um, every peer assessor is trained and um, it's important to know they've been peer assessed themselves. OK, so they do know what you're going through. They have been through the process themselves. OK, and um, at the day they have to attend for two training days every year. We have it at the, at the end of March. And um, at the training day, um, they go through many, many, many um, uh, aspects of what's new to Castle Po. This year, we're going to do a lot of training on consent again. Um, uh, so, you know, um, it might be on interviewing techniques, on SMART goals, all sorts of topics are covered on that two day training period. They also um, have an opportunity to look at all of this information um, from yourselves um, and they will put a sticker on with their name um, saying that you are one person they could possibly peer assess. They will also look at your name and if they feel as though they're in a conflict of interest, there are other stickers that say, do not match me with this registrant. Maybe they know you, maybe they've known you from the past or something like that. And they feel as though it might be a conflict of interest. So that is phase two of the matching process. Then um, the week after the peer assessment uh, training days, um, uh, Julie, um, the assistant to the quality assurance program, and I go through all of them and we complete the matching. So um, 
obviously it's going to be a peer assessor who's in the same line of work as yourself but then we also look at things like location um, uh, we try to be as financially responsible because peer assessors are reimbursed for their travel so if we can get those peer assessors in the east of the province um, we have some in Cornwall and Ottawa, if they can be doing the east side, maybe Belleville or Kingston, and the west side, and the north, and of course central. So we do have peer assessors from around the province. So then you are sent a letter. So you will hear in the first week of July, I mean, of April, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. The first week of April, yes, you will hear in the first week of April, I'm just looking at the calendar, uh, who is your peer assessor? And you have an opportunity to veto that peer assessor. Now, you needn't tell me why. It uh, can remain completely confidential. Um, you don't have to give me a reason, but you might feel as though you know them from the past, it's a conflict of interest, or a colleague knows them and says, oh, I don't think that's a good match, or what have you. We've had in the past, um, in people who are in private practice, say um, the peer assessor is in another private practice, whom we are in competition, so I don't want her. Uh, that is absolutely reasonable. And so um, for those reasons, so you're given a week to veto. We never tell the peer assessor that they've been vetoed. We will then send you the name of a second peer assessor. Now, that peer assessor will never be told that they are choice number two, okay? And um, uh, and then at the end of the week, if you have not contacted us, we know from your perspective that the matching is now complete and we let the peer assessors know and they then have access to your SAT. They can go on and see your evidence and your learning goals. So I am just having a look to make sure we've covered everything with matching. And yes, we have. So now let us move on to the psych visit. And I'm just going to have a quick cup, a uh, drink of coffee. Good. OK, so the site visit. Now, as you know, you have got a rough idea of when you would like the site visit to take place. So this um, peer assessor will be in contact with you to arrange some mutually convenient dates. Now, if you have elected November, December, it might not be practical for you or the peer assessor to um, select an actual date now. You might want to, you might want to wait. So that's completely reasonable. So they would just let us know it's happening in November, December, and that's fine. And then when you do um, agree on a date, maybe in September, October, then they'll let us know, okay? It is the peer assessor's responsibility to let us know. All right. Now, I want you to know that life happens and it might something might come up and you might have to change the date of the site visit. That's absolutely fine. OK, so let's think about your preparation for the site visit. OK, so number one, let's think about the 10 charts or records that you will be preparing for the site visit. So we do have a checklist here for chart review. Let's have a look at it. And it is actually based on the records regulation. It goes through every element of the records regulation to ensure that uh, the information is contained in your record. Now, the records, again, they can be current 
or they can be um, discharged. But remember, it's got to be within the last three years. OK, so 2017, 18 and 19. Now, a lot of this is going to be there anyway. But let's start off the patient or client's name, address, phone number and date of birth. Now, this doesn't have to be on every single sheet throughout the record but um, it does have to be somewhere front and center. Um, the date and purpose of each professional con contact, et cetera, you can go through this. But don't worry if a lot of these are not applicable to you or may be applicable in one chart, but not applicable in the other nine. So let's have a look. Uh, this one, every professional service that was commenced but not completed including the reasons for non-completion. So maybe someone moved schools, someone moved out of the area, um, et cetera. So you would, maybe one of your charts has an example of that, that's fine. Nine others don't, that's absolutely fine. Nine others didn't move out of the area or stayed in the school. OK, so don't think you've got to find patients that meet or, you know, or, or students that meet all of these. You don't. OK, I mean, uh, look at this. Every refusal of treatment. Maybe you don't have a refusal, um, uh, et cetera. Every record of consent. Remember, you have to have that in every chart about consent. So. For those of you who are in private, there is also a financial record. Now, you don't actually have to have a separate financial record. Look at your invoice. Make sure that uh, if, you, if your invoice covers all of this required information, it could be that you just have an invoice in the one patient record. OK, that's absolutely fine. So you are preparing your 10 records. Now. Let's just go back here. Um, I am going to go back to the peer assessment program. Out of that 10, select one chart for your clinical reasoning tool. You are going to be doing two clinical reasoning tools um, uh, going through the process. Uh, one is going to be with a record of your choice out of the 10. So think of which one you want to um, use. OK, now the other piece of preparation is let's go back to Skillshare. We're going to go to professional standards, back to a fresh professional accountability. Think of which two documents you want to discuss along with the conflict of interest standards okay we have position statements practice guidelines um, and standards now choose two documents that absolutely relate very closely to your practice all right and uh, let your peer assessor know before the site visit what the documents are OK, so they can read and be prepared. Now, the other thing is go into your learning goals because you will be discussing your learning goals. Now, they will be looking at two um, sections of this, a few sections, actually. First of all, they'll be going into 2019. So make sure that you have your 15 clacks for 2019. OK, now, if you have information that you can upload, that's great. You can upload it, but you are not required to upload for every single clack. Sometimes it might be reading. Sometimes it might be uh, reading an article you no longer have access to, or it could be that um, uh, you're reading an article from the website. Well, that's silly to upload it from the website. You know, you can just talk about it. OK, um, so um, 
when uh, they'll be looking at your goal and at your CLACs for 2019, okay? Then they will also be looking at your 2020 goals as well, having a bit of a discussion with you. So make sure, I'm going into one of the goals now, make sure that you um, use uh, progress to meeting a goal that you've pulled it down because they might have a conversation with you about that and the impact on your practice, whether it's been a minimal impact or a significant impact, et cetera, and they will want to know that as well. So in summary, make sure your goals are up to date, make sure you've got your 15 clacks for 2019 you can upload evidence if you want you are not required to do so but you might want to now and then another tip is that i would upload or uh, you know at least add a new activity here um, for this year okay so All right, uh, and let's say it was independent learning. Okay, save changes, and there it is. So um, I would um, add, upload any clacks that you have for this year, but remember you're not required to have 15 for this year until December the 31st. So I'm going to quickly see what the question is. Can you confirm we don't, have to submit anything for um, 5.2? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. Let's go back to the professional standards. No, I think you would. What a good question. Uh, you would have to, um, a, a uh, you behave in a professional manner. So um, let's see the examples. Um, and here you have lots of examples. So I would um upload something here all right good question thank you all right um uh i think there was another question so i'm going to uh have a look at the question box um right what about private where there is no term how could you show documentation if a client just trailed off um, well, presumably, um, uh, you have a notation that um, uh, because you would be, if they just trailed off, presumably you've called them, you would have noted in your call, you know, are you coming back, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's good. Um, okay, we answered that. We answered that one, and uh, we will review three in total, the conflict of interest and two others, correct? You mentioned we need to select one file for the clinical reasoning tool. Are we given another file to use at that tool? I'm just about to come on to that. So good, good, good. All right, so I'm going to minimize that so we've talked about the preparation so let's now talk actually about the site visit so um give your peer assessor good directions not only to your place of work but inside Com uh, hospitals are so complicated i worked in one for 20 years or so very complicated building so give them good directions and then tell them about parking don't worry that they have to pay for parking okay now if you have an electronic file you will have to make sure they have access to the electronic file some health record um, departments want to give the peer assessor a unique code others want you to be there um, uh, for the code okay and and use your code now i've said that you are to prepare 10 charts so the second clinical reasoning tool will be chosen by the peer assessor 
from one of the charts that they've reviewed. So you tell them which one the chart you're going to use for the clinical reasoning tool. Then the second clinical reasoning tool will be one of the 10. Now they will probably review only that, that one, uh, the one you've chosen, and maybe four or five others, okay? Sometimes um, if they feel as though they need a little bit more evidence and assurance, they will review a few more. Um, but anyway, then they will tell you about which um, uh, chart they have chosen for you to do your clinical reasoning. So you will know that it's one of the 10. So they will arrive at your place. They will certainly have a conversation with you to put you at your ease, explain their role. They are all um, clinical um, members of the college, none of them, um, uh, you know, are in just administration or what have you, they're all clinical. As I said, they've all been peer assessed. They will then probably do the chart review. Um, I would stay close at hand. You don't actually have to be hovering with them. You could do some um, other work if you wanted to for that time, but I wouldn't book in patients. It will take about three quarters of a day. Then they will do the document discussion of the three documents, two of your choice, one, the conflict of interest, and then they'll be going through your goals and learning goals and CLACs. So um, I think that is everything um, that I wanted to say about the site visit. I see we have a question, so I'm just going to it. Please, can you assure us again where to find the clinical reasoning tool? Okay, absolutely. You go into peer assessment. Whoops, um, I'm just going to go. So don't forget, let's go, let's go back home and remind you. So we're home. You go into registrants, quality assurance, scroll down, peer assessment. Okay, and there you have the clinical reasoning tool and the clinical reasoning tool guide. Now, don't forget clinical reasoning tool is basically a conversation of why you did what you did. It isn't expected that your reasoning will be documented in the patient record. I mean, let's have a look at some of the questions. Question two, what is, if it's current or was, if they're discharged, unique about the patient? I mean, all of us are unique. You'll be able to answer that uh, very easily. There are some, some considerations for you here to think about. Is there something cultural, psychosocial, behavior, medical history, et cetera? So it's really looking for all of these um, elements. So take your time, have a look at it. It is there. I'm just going back into here. All right, good question. Oh, I see we've got another question. Um, okay, what are they looking for in the discussion of the documents? I think I have just explained that. It is why you did what you did. Now, if you go into, um, let me go back into here. If you go back into the guide, there is a clinical reasoning tool guide and it goes over everything, what they will be looking at, what they will not be looking at. Um, so look at this, what will not be evaluated. It doesn't ev uh, evaluate your clinical choices, rather to the extent that you engaged in clinical reasoning. So, and then we have examples um, uh, in here in the guide, um, yeah. Uh, I think the guide really should help you. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're back here. Now, site visit is completed. What can you expect? One of three things. First, that they will just say that they will be submitting a summary. Now, that means that you meet all of the standards, you have clinical reasoning, and your goals and CLACs meet the requirements. And you will be sent a copy of the summary within a week 
after we've received it from the peer assessor and they have 10 working days okay now the summary will be short I cannot emphasize this enough that is because we want to keep it as reliable as possible okay we don't want you you know the committee what do they do with someone who um says um someone is exemplary versus someone who meets the standard so it is short you will be a little bit disappointed because you'll be thinking oh my gosh i've just done all of this work and and i just get this summary please rest assured after the process you will get a letter that acknowledges your commitment to the process and all of your work in the peer assessment um, process from beginning to end secondly there might be what we are calling on-site remediation so let's go back to the consents it might be that you are obtaining and documenting consent but there are a number of elements to consent and maybe one of those elements is missing the peer assessor will discuss that with you you will come up with some ideas on how to remediate that how you can change it they will say well what evidence can you give me you'll discuss it and then you will agree upon a time frame you'll upload that evidence to your self-assessment tool the peer assessor will review it and then write a summary now the quality assurance committee will not know that it was personally you that went through the on-site remediation process they are given um, uh, aggregate data uh, once a year, once or twice a year. Okay, so um, that's important as well. And also, don't forget, this is a totally anonymous process. They never know your names. So you will all be given a number, PA, peer assessment, and then 1 to 65, so 17, and then 20, the year you were selected. Okay, now the third. Um, uh option of what might happen at the end of the site visit is that you were found not to meet the standard in a number of areas and that that will go to the quality assurance committee okay um now when you are sent the report and you get to see the summary or the report you have the opportunity to send the quality assurance committee a response okay and then the committee will review that um, uh, they'll review the report and your response if you send one you don't have to it, it's your choice but if you send one they will review that now um, don't worry we do redact the information and they will never see your name so they'll see the response but not your name and then they will make a decision now in the peer assessment um, it will go back into the guide and you will see um, all of their um, the committee's uh, options so they could be requiring you to upload more evidence to show that you're meeting the standard you might have to participate in the consent and capacity e-learning module which is on our website or you might be required to participate in a, an education and remediation program with a peer coach so all of that information is here all right so that is what might happen that those three options you you're just going to get a summary because you meet standards um, on-site remediation and then a summary because you make a plan and then you are found to meet the standards or a report that goes to the quality assurance committee and they decide the next steps okay now they meet about eight times a year quite frequently over the summer to move the um, uh, site visits and the um, reports through so you don't have to wait long. So I'm going back into the questions. Um, 
Right. Uh, so uh, um, the documents, including the conflict of interest, conflict of interest one, your choice two, your choice three. OK, um, at my site, many clinicians will at various points of time have contact with one uh, client. Is that an issue with the files that we select for uh, peer review? Absolutely not. The peer assessors are very used to that, especially in hospitals where you might have um, two or three um, SLPs charting in the patient record about that specific patient. They are only going to be looking at your entries. However, be aware that they will be looking um, to make sure that consent was obtained and documented as well. But otherwise, they're just looking at yours. Um, they are not looking uh, at, at other SLPs and their um, contributions to the chart. So um, that should not affect your choice of the 10 records that you prepare. Do we fill out the site visit checklist or does the assessor? Good question. Um, actually, it's really a resource for you. Um, so let us go back into it. Um, you, you know, you can um, absolutely, um, if you want to, just print it out. You just click print here. Uh, it might help you. And then look, you've got patient ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, the peer assessors will be printing it out as well. And they will come and uh, they will be um, either using um, a printed version or an online version. So um, you don't have to. It's just a resource. So um, you know what they will be looking for. Sorry, I don't think I made my question uh, clear. What are they looking for in the discussion of the three documents? Ah, good. OK, they are looking. Uh, you will be discussing how the documents relate to your practice. So if you have support personnel, you might choose the position statement on the use of support personnel so you have the document and you will be saying you know yes i found this interesting certainly my um, support personnel have these competencies this is how um, i show that i am supervising you know um, or something like that so it's just a good discussion about how the document relates to your practice it's a way to discuss how you incorporate regulation into your everyday practice so thank you i think that's important um can we use charts or evidence from clients we started seeing in 2020 absolutely they can be current um and you know if you are having a site visit in september you might want to think about just preparing your charts in august or if you're at a school you might think of selecting some charts maybe in june or otherwise wait until september you know um absolutely so uh Okay, you uh, when you're discussing the three documents, it's absolutely not a test. You will have the document there and it will be just a discussion on how the contents of the document, the standards, the competencies, etc., relate to your practice. So it's not as though it's a quiz or anything like that. Okay, so uh, we have about three minutes left. I am absolutely here for any other questions that you might have. One of the purposes of this webinar is to break down barriers, to let you know that I am here, um, along with Sarah Chapman Jay, who is the Quality Assurance and Practice Advisor. And um, uh, for the audiologists, you can contact me, but if you want to speak to Samida Joglakar, who is the audiology advisor and manager of mentorship. Um, and also there is Julie, who is the support administrative assistant to quality assurance. So um, 
I will be in regular contact with you. What I do, if one or two of you have asked me a question that I think it's important for all of you to know, I will just email all of you with the answer, okay? So I hope you have found this helpful. I hope you now feel comfortable enough to contact me um, with any questions that you might have. Email me, phone me. I am here to help you. We will. I will not let the peer assessors know that you are talking to me or contacted me. It is completely confidential, okay? So, um, two more minutes. Are there any other questions? If not, if you would like to leave, I, I will keep this open for another minute or two. Um, but uh, thank you for joining. We had a very good attendance this year for the three uh, webinars. And for those who could not make one of the three, we will be sending one of the recordings. So um, thank you very much for joining us um, and have a lovely afternoon. I hope you're leaving now and going home. I am. So um, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, I will now end the webinar. <laughs>